Four. Excellent. Thank you, one and all. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of our attendees, our panelists today. We have opening remarks from Lichia Noronha, which is the our new secretary from the EMG Secretariat. Lichia, the floor is yours. Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, as Nina just mentioned, I'm Lisa Narona, uh, recently been appointed the head of New York office, but also the secretary of the EMG. And I'm delighted to be here today. And I'm delighted to be here, especially for the Nexus Dialogue, because I think it's it's so much part of the work that we do and so key to, to the whole sustainability, sustainability science work that all of us are so deeply engaged in. And so, being part of the first uh, session that I'm involved in in a Nexus Dialogue is for me a very important uh, and, and um, key uh, aspect of the work that we're going to be very much engaged in. Uh, COVID-19 is a perfect storm. Let's not, uh, uh, let's not ignore the fact that it is touching on our lives all the time. I come from India and you can see the kind of storm that it is creating in India, livelihoods in disruption, and this is everywhere in the world, but at the moment, India is in the spotlight. So this is just the kind of time that we really need to think very deeply into what this means for all of us, what this means for us in the UN, what this means for us outside the UN, because what we are facing today is a huge humanitarian crisis, but we're also facing an issue of, of concern with the future. What do we do to bring about a sustainable recovery? What do we do to ensure that the environmental commitments that countries have signed up to, they are able to deliver on? What we face today is an incredible situation where a lot of money is being um, pumped into the system, 17 trillion, as you've heard from various sources. Not much of it is going into green recovery, but at the moment, countries are so stressed just delivering on recovering, on rebuilding, that it's really difficult for them to start thinking green. And yet it is so important to think green, to think sustainability, because we know very well that this has been caused by, by the environmental degradation around us. This has been caused by an inability to look into how human development and the whole journey of human development is being affected by the environmental crises around us. And so the COVID-19 provides us with a perfect opportunity to think how we turn around COVID and the environment. And, and so it also will feed into the HLPF, it will feed into the uh, Stockholm Plus 50, because all of these, these various events are going to be focusing on sustainable recovery, but are also going to focus very much on how we connect the sustainable recovery with long-term planetary crises. And this is exactly why it's so important for us to focus very much on what, what are the streams, the work streams that we can bring together in the context of this work dialogue. And Nina has, uh, in, in this particular dialogue, has, uh, has told us she's focusing on financing. And we have a fantastic panel here, both from the private finance, but also um, people from public uh, the sector and public finance and fiscal policy, and very much into uh, economic accounting. So all of these come in very neatly together to help us look at a way forward, a path which is going to help us revisit this all in the context of Agenda 2030, and there's absolutely no, no um, question about that. But Agenda 2030 sits there as the framework, the crisis is today, and the planetary crisis go even beyond the Agenda 2030. And so how do we link all of these together to bring them into this very clear discussion that we need to have in order to, to start helping the member states and countries to, to really take this forward in a way that prioritizes the human being, but also prioritizes uh, well-being more generally across the species. I do not want to take up too much time, but I just want to say that this is a very, very important uh, agenda item. It's a very important discussion that we're having today. 
And I also want to tell you that it's the beginning of a conversation around issues uh, relating to the HLPF, but also around Stockholm Plus 50, as I mentioned earlier, because it's, it's really important for us to bring all our different uh, heads together in this discussion, because nobody has the answers to this. Uh, this has come completely out of the blue, but it has created such a deep impression on lives and, and, and the way we live our lives that the only way we can get out of this is to have very clear collective action. It's not doing things new all the time. There's lots that we've already thought about. Ed is here and he's been uh, talking of, of the green economy for a long time. It's not that we don't have the ideas. It's that we haven't worked sufficiently together to bring these different actions together. So these Nexus Dialogues help us to bring these things together, but also need for us to take them together uh, forward. And with the UN uh, reform, this is an opportunity also to take some of the EMG messages into, these, uh, into the UN reform and therefore be much more effective on the ground, which is something that we really hope to do in, in the next stage of the EMG. So with those opening words, let me welcome all of you to this dialogue and wish you all the very best. I will be connected for most of it, but not all of it. But thank you very much for this time. Good morning. Thank you, Ligia. And uh, thank you for emphasizing that, you know, the relationship between economic growth and environmental preservation and, and protection. Um, and of course, for underlying the important role that the finance sector could play in, in this regard. So before asking our distinguished panel of experts to discuss the topic of uh, financing green recovery in, in a, in a post-COVID uh, future, I would like to start with some introductory remarks uh, from a perspective of UNCDF, which is, of course, an organization that works mostly in LDCs and, of course, utilizes financial instruments in, in terms of promoting uh, development activities. So maybe two points to, to start. Uh, first of all, about I would say about three months ago, the UN Secretary General uh, presented the State of the Global Report at Columbia University. And basically he gave a, a bleak picture of the state of the planet. Uh, but he also presented a ray of hope saying that, you know, we have an opportunity also to, to reset the, the world economy and, and transforming it. And basically he put a sustainable economy driven by renewable energies, creating jobs with a cleaner infrastructure, uh, and of course, promo uh, promoting a resilient uh, future as at the forefront of, of his uh, presentation. And I think that's, that's something that is always important to put as, as a framework. Also today, we're facing two dimensions. We're dealing with the, the, with the short term, the immediate term, which is the COVID crisis, which is basically uh, taking all the policymakers and, and, uh, and, and the entire population in terms of dealing with the, the threat to the public health, of course, in terms of the necessity to stabilize economies, but also taking care of those who, uh, you know, need the most and those whose livelihoods are at risk. But uh, there's, uh, we see more and more discussion that there's a second crisis, which is as important and in the, in the perspective of, of a recovery, which is, of course, uh, the environmental crisis and how we start, you know, building back better, but also taking in, into account a, a green recovery element and, uh, and uh, as, as part of, of that effort that is common to everyone. So that leads to the topics that I would like to address today in terms of financing green recovery. So let me start with the obvious, which is not UNCD specific, but of course we, we have a point at the company in a conference now. And of course, I mean, there's a necessity to, to develop new and, and ambitious medium term climate plans. And that's a responsibility that is shared by everyone, uh, the participants here, and of course, the, the governments that we presented there. But going to the points that are more specific to the subject matter that will be discussed today, and uh, that I have more close to our mandate at UNCDF, I think what we would like to talk today is about, you know, how to promote green finance mechanisms and instruments. So a couple of ideas, and that these are things that we're doing, and I'm sure most of our colleagues also are engaged in specific areas, is, is basically emission of green bonds. Um, and of course, targeted guarantees uh, that can also mobilize private finance for green investment. We see, for example, in terms of guarantees, and uh, I see from my own experience, uh, we, we try to um, to support domestic banks, which today are a little bit shying away from certain investment in the countries and prefer to place uh, their resources in fixed income in, in uh, markets abroad. We try to mobilize them by basically offsetting their risk with guarantees and, of course, invest in their economies and, of course, direct their investments in, in uh, green-related investments. So that, that's one. 
The second point I think is the um, trying to build capacities or local governments to handle climate finance at the, at the local level. I think there is uh, an, an important dimension. We always have the tendency to look at it at the, at the central level, central governments. And so from our side, we support uh, local governments to go through the GCF, so the Global Climate Fund accreditation process and develop with capacities and instruments to handle those resources at the level, naturally in, in coordination with the, the, the central government. And in terms of third point I would like to highlight is, is the green investment. So we're talking about investing in uh, private actors. We know that the IMF is estimating that, you know, if we were to transition to a low carbon, low carbon world, it would require about 2.3 trillion in clean energy investment each year. And, and that's a starting point, but there's something we can do. And uh, we see from our side that uh, of course, local carbon technologies have the ability to, to mitigate climate change, but also it's opening new market opportunities. And I think that's that's the element that we'd like to highlight, uh, and as well, of course, support supporting the national climate change plans. But on that side, this is expansion of new markets, and which uh, are expected to improve the demand, but also the efficiency in energy management. And so that could be in low carbon technology in transportation, that's the obvious one. Uh, second obvious one, of course, is electricity through solar, wind, hydro, geothermology. And, and this is something, at least at UNCDF, that we're supporting more and more. Uh, water access and, and water managers, just to give you a few. So while we're all coordinating, and I think all the actors here, um, in terms of an enabling environment to, to reduce emissions, but also to engage the private sector, we do believe that some, let's say, elements that need to be stressed is to reduce the transaction costs and also to improve the financial viability of those companies and reduce the investment risk. And so, of course, there is all a discussion in terms of policy, in terms of the ease of doing business, and, and I think different actors are engaging in that. Uh, setting up local green and climate funds, um, feasibility studies, I, I referred to the green bond market, but also, and then that's where I'd like to um, further expand on, it's basically the de-risking instruments such as guarantees, insurance schemes, and of course loans which can be also deployed. So from our side, we deployed local currency laws, so we offset the forex exposure, but also guarantees to private sector companies, and, and that's, I would say, a way to, uh, and, we, and we focus on uh, SMEs and, of course, in LDCs, where, of course, capital is, is not really enticed and, uh, and, and, and mobilized as it should. And, and I think that's a way to do so uh, around um, uh, green-related uh, um, investments. But also what we're trying to do is, since we're moving... I may gently ask you to wrap up. Yes, uh, we're moving also to connecting those investments to private capital markets and we have two funds. So for us, to, the point is uh, we are coordinated with everyone. I think the last point is coordinating with everyone and we, you know, we're looking forward to participate and coordinate the efforts with the UN on the ground and with all of you. So having said that, I would like to introduce our distinguished panel of experts, uh, let me introduce them. So we have Eric Usher, so the head of UNEP Finance, in, uh, the UNEP Finance Initiative. We have Edward Barbier from the uh, distinguished professor from uh, the University of uh, Colorado State University at the Department of Economics. We have Joy Airy Kim, who's the lead in green fiscal policy at UNEP. Also Dirk Barkers, policy analyst for climate finance and investment environment uh, at the OECD. We also have um, Ono van den Heuvel, the global manager of the GEF, uh, UNDPGF Biodiversity Finance Initiative. And finally, Floske Kursus, stakeholder engagement lead at ING. So I would like to start and hand over to Eric Ursher, who will start the meeting by providing us his perspective on the important role of sec uh, that the finance has in supporting and creating a stronger and greener economy recovery. Uh, Eric, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, uh, Xavier, and a pleasure to be with you all today um, for this uh, virtual event. Um, you know, in, in terms of the, the COVID crisis uh, and the role of the, the financial sector, 
um, uh, aside from all the very significant health and security um, challenges and the economic impacts, um, you know, one observation is um, at least the, the financial sector uh, worked reasonably well. And when I say that, I'm talking about both public, so central banks and, and the private commercial financial community um, did manage to, through very quick response, a lot of it learned from the last the global financial crisis, um, how to move quickly, and through that managed to keep finance flowing during the pandemic. So uh, at least it didn't make the problem worse um, uh, and actually allowed to keep, essentially keep the lights on within businesses, within communities. Now, um, looking forward, we certainly have um, well, a lot of challenges, but very three very significant question marks, I think many of which will be spoken to by um, this panel today. First being um, the macroeconomic implications on, particularly on developing countries and um, uh, you know, the, 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 the level of economic shock, um, loss of, of um, uh, well, activity, including um, in terms of tax base, what this means for countries to be able to build back. Very significant challenge. The IMF and others are providing uh, emergency facilities. It will still take some time to see um, how effective those have been. The second um, significant question mark is, as uh, Alicia has mentioned, $17 uh, trillion already committed in different ways through stimulus. Um, a lot of that through um, um, central banks and others buying up private sector securities to maintain a floor um, uh, within the economy. Um, there is a question mark of when those get unwound, what will be the impact um, essentially of, um, could that create a, a market shock, um, uh, how to manage that? And of course, the third question, which is really central to today's discussion is how will these stimulus funds um, be spent, particularly not the emergency facilities that were just keeping the, um, the funding flowing, but those that actually are going to be um, aimed at um, uh, focusing on economic recovery. Um, I think going forward, the relationship or the alignment between the public and private finance community will be key. Um, as we know more widely, if we talk about achieving the sustainable development goals, you know, trillions more um, will be required. The state coffers, um, you know, in a short term have been able to respond to a crisis, but definitely can't do this on a continuing basis. And therefore the private sector you know, really needs to be um, playing the probably the primary financial mobilization role, but they need to be aligned to society's needs and challenges. Um, what we've also realized is that sitting back and waiting to be regulated or mandated um, is no longer enough. Um, and we, we do have a new tool that I think is getting more credibility, which is the science, is that lead financial actors are realizing that, you know, politics are, are complicated, geopolitics are complicated, but on issues like climate change or other um, environmental risks, you actually have the science, you can track the science and you can get a, an idea of the fact that these issues are not going away, they're only going to get worse and therefore there is going to be a response, technological, um, uh, policy related or um, customer related, um, and it makes sense to actually get aligned and get started, be predictive. If we think about climate change, um, the big challenge is not understanding what has happened in the past, it's being predictive having scenario models to understand how the economy, how different industries are going to change going forward. This is gonna pose new risks. Uh, it also obviously poses opportunities. So how will the stimulus be spent? Uh, Fatih Birol, uh, the head of the uh, International Energy Agency um, pointed out um, in the midst of the crisis that we actually have no longer have 10 years to address climate change. We actually only have three years because three years is the period in which most of the stimulus monies are gonna be committed. And if they get committed in the wrong way to a high fossil uh, focused economy, then essentially we will not be able to stabilize at two degrees well below, uh, probably north of three degrees. So, I mean, just before the crisis, um, one of the, I think, positive aspects is the, the race towards net zero did start to get moving. Um, uh, we've been involved in the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, which was launched in 2019 by Secretary General Guterres. Um, today, it's, it has about six trillion in resources or manages, which is about the size of the German economy. So it's not the whole world, but it's a significant share. These um, 35 investors who are all large investors in their economies 
are issuing their 2025 emissions reduction commitments today in the UW Glasgow. Most of the reductions are in about the 25% scale. So these investors like Allianz or AXA, they're really they're the size of small economies who are committing to reduce emissions by about a quarter in the coming four years. It's quite significant. Um, John Kerry, um, in a press event um, after the Biden summit, um, recently commented that why would the Let US ask you to wrap up? NPC, thank you, Nina. Um, why, why does a why does a, a government increase their NDC? Well, he said, look at the private sector and what they're doing. Essentially, here we have policy following in, um, investors. Uh, and so that relationship public to private is so critical. We also very recently launched the Net Zero Banking Alliance and also a similar one of insurers. So they are getting focused on the climate challenge. But the overall approach to SDG alignment, um, we believe it's best captured by development in 2019, which the launch of the UN Principles for Responsible Banking. And I'm happy we have Flosky today with us from ING. She was one of the co-authors, drafters of these principles. And these principles are about how does a bank align its products and services, its strategy, um, and how does it measure impact in the financing provided and be able to set business targets to make improvements in impact, whether it's in climate, for instance, this net zero alliance I mentioned, which is the climate part of the PRB, um, whether it's on gender equality, on biodiversity, resource efficiency, financial inclusion, uh, which is a key area in terms of the co uh, COVID response, and we have uh, many banks who are acting to put in place new types of digital services, specific services targeting uh, vulnerable customer groups uh, to be able to provide the, the certainty, uh, access to resources needed to, to ride out um, challenges like we've seen through COVID. So COVID is, a, is testing the resilience of countries, of communities, of companies. And I, I think building back better means investing in resilience at all levels. It means the private sector aligning their full business strategies with the needs of society. Uh, Xavier has talked about the important development of green bonds and going forward, we believe it's no longer about individual green bonds, it's about greening the entire bond portfolio. We need to be aligned. We can no longer do these um, environmental social actions at the margins and then continue business as usual. Building back better is really aligning everything that we do towards the needs of society that can create societal and company prosperity and growth. Thank you very much. Xavier, I'm sorry, you are muted. Technology. Uh, yeah, thank you, Eric, for these excellent remarks from the perspective of the UNEP Finance Initiative. I would like to welcome Mr. Edward Barbier from the Colorado State University. Edward, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Xavier. Uh, I'd like to give a, a big picture, uh, which is um, why is it that we're seeing an alignment of financial interests with economic interests on green recovery? Well, financial sectors concerns and the green recovery concerns are converging on the issue of reducing global environmental risks. And you can see that with three major developments that's occurred in the financial sector in recent years which um, all the panelists have mentioned so far. One is that um, businesses increasingly are adopting net carbon, net zero carbon emission targets and acting on it. Uh, secondly, um, there's been increasing use of internal, internal carbon pricing to screen financial investments. And thirdly, everyone's talked about the growth of the green bond and other financing uh, mechanisms. And all these are being driven uh, within the financial sector. Um, the financial sector wants to see businesses act on a climate strategy to reduce climate risks uh, as they impact their businesses, hence the, the focus on net zero targets as, as, a, as a strategy for businesses to achieve that to please their investors and, and financial uh, institutions. In addition, car, internal carbon pricing um, has a simple role. It's, it's alerting uh, financial investors to if their investments are put into a company or business today, um, what's the likely impact, including on uh, greenhouse gas emissions on the returns on that investment, and of course, in mitigating climate risks. Um, and, and investments are being screened using this tool increasingly. The growth of the green bond market um, is symptomatic of the growth of green financing in the private sector in general. 
Um, it, we started off with green bonds in 2008 during the height of the green recession. Uh, they're now worth about $250 billion. Uh, the, London, uh, the Luxembourg Stock Exchange has a green exchange just for green bonds. Um, and so green bonds are real. And uh, they're particularly uh, important with regard to climate financing in areas of energy efficiency, renewable energy, um, and, and transportation projects, less so in the areas of land use change, biodiversity conservation, and marine projects. But nonetheless, green financing is on the rise. So with these three developments, the financial sector now has got a stake in greening the recovery. Um, and then that means that um, they're looking for certain things. And I think the way the finance sector can support uh, green recovery packages is in three ways. Um, first is um, the financial sector uh, can push for policy reforms and long-term investments in green recovery packages that lead to true reduction in climate risks. Again, a simple question needs to be asked. For every dollar spent on a green investment, what is the return in within five to five, 10 years of uh, reducing climate risks as well as economy-wide gains? And that means a focus, a shift in focus to investments that are long-term, um, um, away from just stimulus investments which are important in a crisis to actual long-term investments in infrastructure and supportive innovation. Things like smart grid uh, uh, transmissions, charging networks for electric cars, um, building coastal infrastructure that's more re resilient, um, uh, sustainable transport. And I may so encourage you to wrap up. Sorry? If I may encourage you to wrap Yes, up. I'm doing that. And, and um, the other thing would be um, private R&D, uh, sorry, public support for private R&D innovation. The second thing the financial sector can do uh, is push for uh, what we need to make uh, green structural transformation occur is carbon pricing and pricing reforms. That includes ending the billions of dollars in fossil fuel subsidies. Um, uh, right now, I mentioned the green bond market is about $250 billion. Fossil fuel subsidies around the world um, are at least uh, that much, if not to closer to $500 billion per year. Um, carbon pricing, every study after study shows that we need a carbon price at least $50 per ton and rising over time in the medium to long term uh, in order to get the types of innovations and investments we need. The financial sector is already screening investments. They, they would like to see uh, actual carbon prices uh, to, to drive those investments and innovations. And then finally, um, uh, something that's not in packages right now or being talked about is we need business regulatory policies and incentives to help the financial sector expand on those three developments that I already talked about. Um, internal carbon pricing, uh, net zero emission targets, and of course, expanding green bonds to get into areas such as biodiversity conservation, blue carbon, uh, and so forth. Um, thank you very much, and I return it to the speaker. Thank you, Edward, for these important insights on, on how the financial sector can contribute to build a better and greener future. Um, I would like to welcome Ms. Joy Perry Kim. She's the lead for green fiscal policy at UNAP. Thank you. Thank you very much, Xavier, and then uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, I think that it has been already mentioned by previous speakers on issues such as the carbon pricing and environmentally harmful subsidies. I mean, I'm glad to hear Eric saying that, you know, that everyone actually has to take actions for green financing and perhaps the private investors and finances should actually flow. But I think that actually goes hand in hand with the public uh, policy uh, when it comes to uh, you know, securing financing for green recovery. So let me just uh, uh, zoom up a little bit and then you know, give you also a big picture in terms of where the current recovery spending is going and what message is actually sends to the private investors. Um, so we, UNEP together with the University of Oxford actually has recently launched a global recovery observatory, which actually tracks the 50 largest economies green recovery spending. And unfortunately actually shows that there is a high risk of missing the opportunity to invest for resilient and sustainable recovery. Um, the total spending of this 50 largest economy shows uh, the 14.6 trillion US dollars, out of which 1.9 trillion US dollars were geared towards recovery. 
but unfortunately only 18% of recovery spending and 2.5% of total spending had a, a green characteristics. In other words, the, the current public spending to build a resilient and sustainable economy is not sufficient. So what do we do when globally the countries are facing severe fiscal constraints with the debt pressures and the global tax revenues are expected to fall? And you know, how, what kind of messages can we actually send to the private investors and private sector to finance green recovery? I think that the first key action is to improve the efficiency of government uh, expenditures and spending. And I think that uh, Ed Barbie mentioned about the faster fuel subsidies, um, which actually provides also perverse incentives. And you know, this kind of public spending sends the wrong messages to the private sector where they should actually put their money in. And when you look at the G20's uh, commitment for the recovery, um, it shows that at least the $233 billion were committed to supporting uh, fossil fuel energy, and at least an $199 billion US dollars out of that were unconditional supporting for fossil fuel energies. Um, and uh, when you look at the other perverse incentives uh, and uh, inefficient government uh, spending, such as agriculture support, that are also environmentally harmful for biodiversity and climate change, at least the 300 billion US dollars uh, were provided in form of uh, price incentives. Uh, in terms of uh, another uh, element that is important, obviously, is to raise the tax through the reforming of tax systems in the COVID, uh, post COVID 19 period. Um, and given the importance of equity uh, to be at the center in design. Let me gently ask you to wrap up. COVID, uh, thank you, uh, 19 uh, uh, tax, uh, tax system. Uh, measures such as um, introducing a higher uh, tax uh, for the corporate corporations with the excess rates of return is important. Also introducing uh, indirect taxation such as environmental taxations is important. There, there, there has been an estimate suggesting that the tax of 12.5% per liter of gasoline and diesel could generate 1 billion uh, US dollars worldwide daily. And of course, um, due consideration should be given to the disparity of capacity in financing recovery between the advanced economies and low income, low income economy, economies and the developing economies. Uh, when we look at the total per capita spending in 2020 for the recovery in advanced economy, it was 17 times higher than that uh, of emerging and developing economies. And of course, the current measures such as that service suspension initiative is helpful, but it's only a temporary measures because it doesn't actually address the underlying causes. Um, so uh, from a public uh, sector's perspective, I think that there is a need to explore like innovative fiscal measures, such as that swap for nature and tapping in the sovereign rest funds for green investment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joy, for your relevant and, and timely intervention and uh, sharing the perspective uh, of UNEP. I would like to welcome Dirk Rodgers from the OECD. Uh, Dirk, the floor is yours. Thank you, Xavier, and thank you also to the organizers uh, for this kind of invitation uh, for me to talk a bit about you know, what the OECD thinks, the, how to scale up finance, how to bring in the finance sector, and how to uh, build an enabling so as, uh, I'm working at the OECD Center on Green Finance Investment, where we do the annual uh, forum on green finance and investment, where we bring together, you know, private and public stakeholders to discuss this every year. And obviously, you know, the last year the forum was held under the deep impressions of the COVID crisis, and which for, for us also was the deep impression of the, the fiscal pressures uh, with which that came. And you know, what could we do to to uh, scale up fi green finance and to uh, mainstream green finance uh, more than it, it already did. We've heard about green bonds, but you know we all know they are not just a drop in the bucket anymore, but still just a fraction of the whole bond market, for example. And that's just one instrument and one side uh, of, of financing. So at the forum, for, I remember very vividly a discussion on institutional investors and how to bring them in more. So how to you know uh, get the deep pockets in the game a lot more. Uh, and we had that discussion back in uh, one of our reports that showed you know, from regulatory perspective, 
you know, if, if you only look at uh, real economy holdings of infrastructure by institutional investors, they could invest, you know, 11.4 trillion US dollars in OECD and G20 countries. Um, but they don't, they only invest in real economy infrastructure only one rather than 11 uh, trillion US dollars in infrastructure. And of that one trillion, only about 30% was green infra. So, you know, how to, how to reach into, not reach into these deep, deep pockets, but how to motivate these deep, deep pockets. Um, and, you know, one thing that you, and, you know, there's a whole list of answers we, we got at the forum and we also provide in the report. Um, and one thing where you really shouldn't mince words here is the, uh, while we do see a trend uh, towards greener investment in the financial market in general, also in its, within institutional investor investments, um, by asset owners and asset managers, there is a threat of greenwashing. There's a this trend towards greener investment, but also, you know, as a suit of papers shows that there is, including, you know, OECD papers, uh, there there is some misleading uh, ESG measurement out there and other types of, of measurement of how green investments actually are. So to mainstream this, uh, this has to has to be rigorous and recent developments in the taxonomy and other definition fields. Uh, definitely encouraging here, um, but there, you know, what needs to be done to to have this environment is to to have clarity, speak the same language uh, within the financial sector, um, and to look into environmental impact um, aside from the financial materiality aspect. So, you know, what impact does corporate activity and investment activity have on the environment rather than the reverse? And this is doubly important, of course, uh, in the current situation where recovery packages are formed and steering this and also steering the policies and regulation in certain ways. And the second important point that I, that I want to make here um, in this context, how to, um, how to scale up uh, private finance and you know, green private finances, the importance of um, pipelines of bankable projects, which you know, I'm sure we've all heard before. Um, but, you know, a bit more in detail, um, it's just for investors, the cost of building the capacity to go into um, green infrastructure, and most of this is, you know, uh, an, an infrastructure story, most of, you know, green, a green recovery story is an infrastructure story. Going into infrastructure, uh, aside from all the other fields that institutional investors invest in, um, means building capacity, and that has to be justified, and it cannot be justified based on a one-off investment. Building these pipelines and making uh, there's a role for the state to make sure that the, these uh, projects keep coming. Sometimes it's just a matter of institutionalizing aspects of the infrastructure investment chain, like setting infrastructure targets for your country, have a planning process in, in place, um, taking care of, of red tape more efficiently. Um, and it can, what's important about pipelines, also an important motivator to have these pipelines in place is that it can enable the use of certain financial instruments which are current which you know would be uh, a possible solution to a lack of recycling of, of uh, funds in the infrastructure markets so that you know banks and projects developers could offload projects from their balance sheet and you know institutional investors could take them on um, for example we see in the report that i just mentioned that there's Can a gently ask you to wrap up yes i'll make that one more point on, on securitized products so in our report we find that um, asset managers in particularly invest in green projects and green infrastructure through securitized products like yield course, but also through, also through infrastructure REITs and uh, INVITs, particularly in India. Um, and this, this is palatable to institutional investors as well as some other you know, investors that are gaining importance here. And securitized products, however, need to be fed by a steady stream uh, of projects in the pipeline. So that for now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dirk, for, for sharing your perspective, uh, of course, from a USCD perspective. I, I will keep the, 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 the point on the pipeline of investable projects and, and the role of blended finance to, to support and, and reveal those projects for, for the end for the discussion. But for the time being, I'd like to um, introduce Ono van der Hoeven uh, from the UNDPGF uh, Finance uh, Initiative. Uh, ono, the floor is yours. Thank you, Xavier, and I will uh, talk a bit more about the perspective of nature and biodiversity. So even just before uh, the COVID pandemic, the situation didn't look all that good. Uh, we did made an estimate about 
how much the world is spending on biodiversity conservation. It turns out it's more than $120 billion per year, more or less, public expenditures. But there are two other numbers we have to compare to. First of all, if you look at the financial needs, they're over 600 billion. So we have actually a huge finance gap and that's actually pre-COVID. So this number is probably right now unmeasured, much higher than that. And another number that's already been referred to is harmful expenditures. So over $500 billion per year, thanks to the OECD, we have this data, is being spent on things that harm nature. So any sort of financing and recovery response has to look at those different dimensions because we cannot just catalyze more finance for nature positive uh, outcomes while the sort of nature negative and climate negative uh, investments continue at the same scale. So I think this is a very useful lens that we can apply to uh, all things uh, recovery. And another uh, sort of more down to the ground perspective is that if you look at financing nature, uh, the impact has been quite negative. We've seen that, of course, tourism was one of the hardest hit sectors by this pandemic and tourists staying home and tourist revenues have dried up. Public budgets are also down and CSR budgets by companies are down as well. So it doesn't look um, all that rosy, I would say. Uh, but uh, within that, actually, there's a kind of difference in terms of the landscape of financing mechanisms. We have seen that actually public budgets, even though they were down, um, biodiversity wasn't as dramatically cut as, uh, as we would have expected uh, so far. And also, for example, national parks that are close to major cities actually saw visitor increases, which may have not been necessarily healthy for the people going there, uh, clustering, uh, but uh, that brought uh, much additional revenue. So I think if you look at what can be done, uh, there's actually a lot of financing mechanisms that we can explore. And at UNDP, uh, BIFIN, uh, we have done a global mapping of financing mechanisms. And we found that actually more than 150 mechanisms exist. And this includes everything from green bonds to payment for ecosystem service, for biodiversity offsets, uh, even things like lotteries and conservation license plates. They're all options. And so I think that for green recovery, why not look at those, um, those, all those mechanisms out there? Because financing and economics are so interrelated. And, and then uh, some examples of what we have been doing in the past years on some of those mechanisms. So to respond directly to the pandemic, we started a global crowdfunding campaign, which is called Keep Conservation's Heroes in Their Job, because we saw that a lot of vulnerable communities they're immediately running out of money. When tourists stop coming, they didn't, of course, build up a very big uh, financial reserve. And so we started some crowdfunding campaigns. We run one in the Philippines for a small dwarf buffalo called the Tamara. And we raised more than $30,000 uh, for local rangers so that they could still have a little bit of income, uh, which they were lacking. And another campaign in Thailand was related to boatmen in Koh Tao Island. And we used a cash for work modality so that people would not just earn some money but also do something in return in effect they helped to clean up the beaches and also the coral reefs because even though tourists were not coming waste was still coming from the ocean so i think there's this these are kind of more short-term response but if you look at the medium and long-term response i think public budgeting is is the most important finance source for biodiversity so we have to step up our efforts there and also spend the money better that we already have uh, but there are other mechanisms like, for example, conservation trust funds that are proven very effective uh, because they're using uh, money to invest and only with the revenue they spend money back on biodiversity conservation. So it turns that they were quite resilient against this uh, financial crisis that followed the uh, global pandemic. And also uh, we worked in uh, Zambia to develop a green bond framework and again, um, look at the bonds already the case for energy and climate is just so much easier to make right now and for nature related and green bonds uh, there's just a lot more work that needs to be done and UNP is uh, piloting a new mechanism called performance based uh, nature nature performance based bonds uh, where Can we gently ask you to wrap up yes uh, where actually the um, the debtor country is committing to a certain conservation goal. And once that's fulfilled, actually um, a debt has been uh, reduced, similar to a debt for nature stuff that was already mentioned by Joy, but it's gonna be a quite new innovative uh, model. Um, so that's uh, just a bit of a perspective from nature and uh, back to you, Xavier. 
Thank you, Ono. It's, it's very interesting to, to have your perspective from nature and, and of course, uh, having concrete ideas in terms of instruments and approach can be used, a financing approach that can be used from the, the short term down to mid to long term. Um, having said that, I would like to welcome now uh, Floske Kuse from ING. Uh, Floske, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. Hello, everybody. As a last panelist, I try to add the private sector perspective to this um, dialogue. Uh, and introduce some notions from ING's side, also trying to talk on behalf of some of our clients, because ultimately, of course, it's private sector actors, companies in the real economy that will bring about the change that we need. And it's financial players like ING that finance that change. And then there's, of course, a very important third player here, governments. So you could say it really takes three to tango here and I think we're all ready and we know ready to go standing on the edge of the pool and we're looking at each other thinking oh, the water is pretty cold but we've trained for this we can do this so how can all three of us all three players play the role we have to play as best as we can i think that is the the main question and for financial actors that's not only um, a matter of doing the right thing it also makes good business sense. Edward Barbier already mentioned it. Um, mitigating risks, so addressing sustainability risks, of course, in the end means future-proofing the companies you finance and therefore future-proofing your balance sheet. And bankers by nature are risk averse, we're risk mitigators, that's what we do. And we'd like to try and count um, value on the one hand and risks in numeric value on the other hand. So what would be um, key to this transformation we need would indeed be fair carbon pricing. That would enable us to do so much more to price in these externalities that don't have a real value now. And next to that, if all of us could have our eyes on the horizon a bit more the long-term perspective and think about um, our common purpose, so long-term value that would unite us even more in collaboration. So next to think that it takes three to tango, I'd like to stress the fact that we really need to close the gap between ambitions and action. So while it's all very well and good, of course, that with two um, UN summits upcoming, biodiversity and climate, you know, the one statement is even bigger and bolder than the other. And that's the good beginning. We need a moonshot, but we also need real action. And that is where trust and transparency come in. Um, trust in the sense that the more open we can share our insights and for instance, have access to open source tooling, but also to data, the faster we can move. Um, and also we not, do not need to reinvent the wheel, uh, you know, all companies one by other or our financial institutions, this is pre-competitive stuff. And transparency, I really feel that accountability, um, even linking to greenwashing will take main stage. I hope it will take center stage. We need to live up to these commitments and um, well, all of the observers um, that are listening in, civil society actors, um, you know, hold us true to our promise because um, it starts with, with that big ambition, but then we need to take the, the smaller steps and need to start moving. And we can't afford to just wait another couple of years before setting um, short term or intermediate term targets. So I think this is what we need to be looking for next, sharing insights, methodologies, having access to data and building on trust to aim for transparency and get to action soon. Thank you. Well, thank you for this critical perspective, and I fully agree. We, we need not only more transparency, but it's it's good to have here a space where public uh, or international organization, in this case, we're representing the public, academia, and, and, and private sector are talking and, and, and trying to define ways and a common path. I think we're now moving to the discussion, and I have a couple of questions with for all of you. If I understand, and I'm doing that under the, the scrutiny of Nina, about half an hour, is that correct, Nina? So to, to break the ice, maybe I, I like to pick up on, on, the, on the reference of uh, the investable pipeline. Um, 
we we know that you know there is financing, but what we told, and I think at uh, our different levels and, and in our different engagements, is that everybody is seeking uh, investable pipeline, uh, and it's very difficult to find it to reveal it, and that's where blended finance can play a role in terms of de-risking that pipeline and bringing, let's say, closer to let's say, commercial capital. Um, and I was wondering, what is your point of view? Is that the correct statement? And if that is the case, what, what can we do? And, uh, you know, in the, in the spirit of, of collaboration that Floske indicated, where, where can we hold hands and, and, and work together in terms of revealing, uh, let's say, a, a greater um, uh, pipeline of investable projects within, of course, the, the green economy space uh, to other investors, whether they're domestic or, or international? Uh, I don't know if I have someone who would like to start uh, to that question, which is, of course, open-ended, and I'm sure we'll, we'll generate a debate on it. Mary Lise, okay, Eric, please. I, mean, I can just give a first, you know, comment or observation about the challenges. Um, uh, you know, you, you have to match up public and private in terms of risk and you know, who's better placed to take risks um, in terms of developing the pipeline. And, and one of the problems there is, is that public sector is often not that comfortable with taking risks um, early on in projects. So public finance often goes quite late um, in terms of risk mitigation or in terms of um, uh, co-financing or blended finance. And I guess one of the calls is new public instruments to actually try to figure out how to go earlier at riskier stage, uh, when essentially project development in emerging markets really is a, a venture capital type risk exposure. The problem is um, it doesn't provide the returns of investing in, in the next Google. So if you're, if you're developing an infrastructure project, uh, it's costly, it's risky. Um, and the question is why can there not be um, risk sharing or, or, or co-financing at that stage rather than only very late stage where the private sector has almost de-risked projects um, and then capital comes in essentially at the construction phase. So just a call for earlier stage public finance facilities. Thank you, Eric, very interesting. And, and we're taking note of that. Um, any, any other comments? I have three other questions for all of you and I will direct it to specifically to, to some of you based on, on, on basically your um, respective point of views. Uh, oh no, please. Yeah, just very briefly. I think it's it's good again to look at biodiversity where the risk is much behind energy. I think the risking is an approach that has been quite well elaborated for energy. And of course, there are a lot of private investments. So I think that's maybe something that can be explored more in the future by various uh, organizations. There are also a lot of tools and platforms that can be used. We see organizations doing kind of like matchmaking, uh, they're doing accelerator funds. And I think by now there are quite a few of those funds out there. So I think there are quite a quite a, a lot of efforts going around to build this pipeline that we have seen coming up in the last five years. Uh, but uh, I also think we should not only rely again on those, let's say, uh, green investments, but we have to work at the same time on uh, greening um, the other investments, uh, the brown investments. Uh, I think as, as Eric already mentioned, we have to basically not just work on green finance, but also green finance. They're kind of look kind of like the same work stream, but in reality, they're a little bit separate. Thank you, Anove, very interesting. Um, I interpret that the silence will lead to my second question. And, and I will address, oh, sorry. Sorry, if, if I may chime in there on, on de-risking as well. Um, and you, I think it was actually you, Xavier, who, who mentioned earlier that you know loans and loan guarantees are the, the, the mainstay instruments of this. Um, and I mentioned earlier that you know there's this this large shy pool of capital of institutional investors. So we we have actually looked into you know how are these particularly projects where institutional investors come in usually come in very late um, and want you know completely risk free or as risk free as possible uh, projects. You know how how are they motivated? And once you look there, you still find loans and loan guarantees and the, the occasional PPP, so a private public partnership. Um, and when you uh, look uh, look a bit deeper and also you know besides uh, national development banks you find that there's also you know a, a, a strand of these investments that that are done through through funds where you know the the public can co-invests or even holds cornerstone stakes 
um, through, you know, vehicle, not vehicles, that's the wrong word, uh, but institutions like green banks and infrastructure banks. And I'm wondering if during the time of recovery where, you know, there, there, there are large funds to be distributed, if that would be the right time to, uh, um, to build these infrastructure funds to, to keep reinvesting, not necessarily to the disadvantage uh, of the institution, the public institution that does it, as we've seen with the Green Bank uh, in the UK. Um, um, and I'm, I'm wondering if, if that would be a, a, a way to go and a second way to go again to bring in, you know, the, this, this uh, patient long term but shy capital, uh, it would be to, to see if the pipeline could be bolstered in, in a way, setting up funds regularly to have, a, you know, to have the pipeline regularly um, to be able to feed securitized products and, you know, have built the complete chain with the state uh, looking into or even being involved in every part of that chain so that, you know, this, this can be, uh, the, the projects can be regularly offloaded to, um, to the shy capital, so to the portfolios of institutional investors. Yeah, I can tell you, we fully align with your thinking. And, um, but I'm, I'm being asked to, to also follow the script as, as, uh, as I have slightly deviated from it. So um, let me ask uh, and then address the question to Edward on Ono. I was wondering if there's any lessons learned from previous economic recoveries that we can, let's say, piggyback on uh, in terms of building back better and greener. And this is something that you, know, uh, you, you can share with all of us. Um, Edward, would you like to start? Thanks, Andrew. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, in uh, October uh, last year, I, I released a report through UNEP on building a greener recovery, lessons learned from the Great Recession. And I'd like to, I think there's five lessons that are really important. The first is that green stimulus is not the same as green recovery. Uh, stimulus, by definition, is more short term. Its objective is to jumpstart the economy and to get uh, jobs uh, going. Uh, green recovery is about longer term commitments to a, a, a package of five, five years or more. The second lesson is that the nature of investment is therefore going to be different. What we saw in the Great Recession is that green stimulus, two thirds of it was on energy efficiency and, shovel, and the rest was on shovel ready clean energy projects and, this, and the like. Whereas, as I mentioned earlier, the type of investment you want to see, uh, public investment, is to support uh, infrastructure that is to build the green recovery and the transition to a greener economy and to support private R&D and innovation. Uh, so the nature of investments are very different and, 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 and the outlays are, are, are very large. The third lesson is, is again, as I've mentioned in other panelists, is that we're not likely to see a green transition, a green recovery be successful, moving us to a low carbon and, and greener economy unless we have pricing reforms. And the biggest one to change is ending the underpricing of fossil fuels, removing subsidies, and also pricing carbon in that $50 range rising over time. That's what the private sector and the financial sector need, uh, as Flosky mentioned in her comments. Um, but there's a, a new dimension. There's a fourth lesson that's important is that there's not a perfect match with what happened during the Great Recession in here. And one of the biggest ones is what Eric Usher mentioned, which is that uh, the, the green stimulus did not have much of an impact on government deficits and debt. But what we're seeing here is $13 trillion already spent on pandemic standard stimulus in the last year or so. And we're gonna see about $30 trillion in debt accumulated in the next few years. There is not much fiscal space there for public increased public spending on the type of green recovery. And then that leads to the final, um, we need, uh, the final uh, lesson, which is that given all this, the, the lack of fiscal space, um, we, we, we need to use creatively the revenues earned from pricing reforms and saved from pricing reforms uh, in ways to, to help the economy. That could be in terms of putting dividends back to households. It could be in terms of paying for some of the long-term investments we need. It could be in reducing taxes, but that's gonna be a critical com component. So at the end of the day, the lessons we learn are are, 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 is that our, our recovery packages have to have long-term commitments to decarbonization, pricing reforms, and creative use of uh, the revenues generated and savings generated to, uh, to, to um, finance and, and distribute income. 
Thank you. Thank you, Edward. Oh, no, any quick thought on that? Yeah, I just want to build on what Edward mentioned about the subsidies. I think that's been an area that's quite overlooked. So actually, if you look at the biodiversity convention, uh, there were 20 biodiversity targets, perhaps a bit much. Uh, one of them, target three, every country in the world committed to check which of their subsidies have a harmful impact on nature and make a plan to do something about it. And this was pretty much one of the most underachieved targets. And very, if we start to look at examples of countries who did it, and they're very far uh, and few that you can find. So I think that, uh, yeah, one of the lessons is that we didn't look into some areas that we have to look into, because actually, if you work on this issue of subsidies, you can help to create more fiscal space, because if you redesign subsidies, and we're trying not, by the way, to use the word reform, because it's uh, so, so much putting off government officials, but we're using repurposing, redesigning, and rethinking, uh, actually, you can realize savings, and at the same time, so you spend less, and you can have less negative impact on nature and on carbon. And so potentially it's a win-win, but these are very hard, uh, hot potatoes and hard agenda items. So one thing that can really help is analytics. So we have seen that countries that analyze this, all of a sudden see that maybe you can just take out one harmful element, maybe a certain fertilizer or certain, even something simple like a certain type of fish hook, or there are some harmful elements. So we can green the subsidies. We don't have to overhaul all of them. So for every subsidy, we have to do the analytics. And for every subsidy, we can come with a specific plan to green it. Either, OK, eliminating can be an option. Sometimes we just reduce them, or we green them. Or in the best scenario, we can actually repurpose them. For example, if you take conventional agricultural subsidy, you can maybe redesign the subsidy. So more or less the same group benefits, and people don't lose out, while also um, having a more positive impact, or I would should rather say less negative impact on nature. And I think I'll leave that at that uh, because of time. Thank you very much. Very interesting. And, uh, and uh, so maybe two, two questions. One uh, from the perspective of the public sector, and then I will end from a perspective from the private sector. And of course, that will be addressed to, to Floske. Uh, but before doing so, um, you know, if we're talking about an enabling environment for a green recovery, what do you think is the role of the, the public sector to, to build that confidence? And, 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 and let's say catalyze greater support in terms of public and, and uh, a private uh, cooperation. Uh, maybe I can ask Eric Joy uh, to start. Uh, thank you very much. I think that actually has been uh, mentioned already in my presentation, but by other speakers as well. Yeah. I mean, the, the first thing is that we actually have to make sure that public spending is efficient and you know, sending a right message to the private investors. It just absolutely does not make any sense that the green recovery spending in year 2020 was 341 billion US dollars. While the scale of subsidies that the other colleagues actually have mentioned are a lot bigger and then this does not actually send the right message to the private investors. Another thing that I would actually mention though is that there is a big concern that um, developing economies and particularly low income countries are going to be left behind when it comes to financing for green recovery as it is and they uh, absolutely do not actually have a capacity to re redirect their resources for a financing green recovery. And that's where the, these innovative fiscal measures, and it can be also innovative financing mechanisms, but need to be explored. And it is assessed at the moment that the half of the least developed uh, countries are at the high risk of uh, uh, um, uh, that dis distress. And the high risk of fiscal crisis. So this is a real and a serious issues for these countries, and we need to actually consider measures how that can actually help countries to release the burden of debt, but also to make sure that they can actually pursue uh, achieving the climate and the biodiversity objectives. That swap actually has been mentioned by ONU as well. The UNDP is uh, taking initiative, initiative in this area. Although this is not a new solution, uh, even if it's a short-term solutions, I think that it can actually release the burden for at least the low-income countries and then, you know, make sure that they will not actually abandon their objectives on climate and biodiversity. Another thing that I actually mentioned as part of the uh, innovative fiscal measures is the sovereign rights funds. Uh, you never actually look at these issues of how the trends of sovereign rights funds investment for green economy is changing. And at the moment, it's a still very small segment of 7.5 trillion 
uh, dollars of asset that the sovereign wealth fund is managing, it's only one uh, percent of that is actually you know to, has a green portfolio. But we actually noticed that it's actually changing. I may invite you to wrap up. Thank you. Uh, so it's actually changing that the it's actually going to a renewable energy uh, infrastructure sector and etc. Um, it actually requires uh, some uh, you know further work to be done in cooperation with the private investors as well because there is a still very high level of a misperception about you know risk uh, in uh, green uh, investing for the green portfolio. So that actually has to be changed. That it actually has to be worked with the portfolio managers and investors, uh, you know, managing the sovereign wealth funds. Thank you. Thank you. Eric, would you like to, to just complement uh, Joy's uh, response? I, I mean, I think one thing interesting we were seeing, particularly in the, in the banking sector and philosophy community speak to this, you know, climate has typically been uh, posed as a, a risk issue, risk of stranded assets and opportunities around, for instance, green bonds. However, you know, the, the race to net zero has taken off faster, I think, than anybody thought. And, and one of the main drivers we're seeing, particularly from the banking sector, is, you know, banks, it's a, it's a narrow margin business. It's hard to figure out how to drive, you know, new product growth in the banking industry today in a low interest rate environment. But banks are realizing that decarbonization is a big opportunity for them. And therefore, I think to your question, what they are looking for is an indication of trying to be predictive of how industries are going to change, how the transport sector is going to change, how building and construction is going to change, agriculture. And basically, they're looking to figure out most changes to low carbon are actually capital intensive, which means you need a bank or you need a financier to help you invest up front. And so they realize this transformation um, is potentially something that will save the banking industry in terms of, of the core role of banks all of a sudden becomes very, very central to addressing it here, the climate challenge. So to your question, I think it's really about getting policy um, targets and indications, things like the phase out of fossil fuel, internal combustion engines, uh, changes in the agriculture sector. Banks are understanding or that they need to be predictive about how these changes are gonna change sectors that they finance and where that actually they can help drive that change along the, the lines of what Duff Fluske has already spoken to. Thank you, Eric. So and now I move from the to the perspective from the private sector. So I mean, how do you see the response from the private sector, Fluske? I mean, do you think it, it has been I apologize? We have Dirk, Arno, and Fluske for the second question. We have what? That's okay, yeah. Nina. I just sick notes of you that, that I basically made my points. Sorry, I did. So Floske, leading back, going back to you. So we'd like to hear your perspective from your from the private sector. We we have the public, uh, let's say, or the international organization perspective. H how do you see that from from your side? Over to you. Thank you. Yeah. So the private sector perspective, right? So um, we recently commissioned a survey, and we asked 450 companies worldwide, as well as 100 institutional investors what their response to the pandemic was with regard to their sustainability strategy. And the outcome is really encouraging because it, it seems to act like an accelerator. I mean, really you can track higher ambitions globally for private sector actors. And this is backed by the stake of investors. Um, they demand not only from companies, but also from banks they invest in that we set these clear targets tied to ambitions. So that is um, a really positive uh, note and really encouraging. But the next question, of course, is will governments then help us raise the bar? So um, following up on what Eric was saying, and yeah, the supporting policies need to be in place, carbon pricing, pricing externalities, but also, for instance, uh, more guidance, climate roadmaps on a national level. That would be something that both banks, uh, but also our clients would be very much helped with. To give a very uh, concrete example, um, there is a national um, uh, law in the Netherlands that um, makes a, a C label, so an energy efficiency label for commercial real estate mandatory um, in 2023. And that was um, issued about uh, three years ago now. So that gave us a reasonable amount of time to reach out to all of our clients proactively and actually say, you know, guys, this regulation is coming. 
and we are already ahead of that curve and we encourage you to already ahead of this regulation become more energy efficient and if not we will not refinance so there is the the carrot and the stick um, being ahead of the curve and ahead of your competitors on the one hand but also being aware of what needs to be done anyways because of um, more policy intervention that is coming but that guidance on on national level is something that is a bit lacking now so it's a bit odd for a banker but we could um, be helped by more government intervention here and we're supported here with uh, the outcome of this survey the clients worldwide very interesting to I'm end sure just on a collective note that would be really great and also to tap into biodiversity because we can work together much more and collective commitments so the ones that we have under the umbrella of the principles for responsible banking are really a great <laughs> platform to do so so next to climate commitments i think we really should look into collective commitments on both biodiversity and of course on the social side human rights gender equality thanks thank you Flosse. Uh, um, we will uh... I, I think we'll circulate the, the, the principle for responsible banking, but we would be also interested in the survey. If, if you could share that uh, you know, with the organizers, that would be very interesting. Anyhow, thank you all for your valued insights. I understand that we now move to a question and answers uh, segment, about 10 minutes. So we'll ask the audience to, um, to ask a couple of questions, which we have already pre-identified. And I will read them to uh, all of you. And I will ask for two volunteers to, to answer to the questions. So the first one is on, since we talk about transparency and monitoring, this one is about, um, uh, we'll read it now. Do we have any scientifically solid and politically accepted indicator, progress indicator that measures the impact of the impact, the green finance, when compared to, I would assume is business as usual finance. In other words, if we, we, if we move 10 billion US dollars from business as usual, to green finance, is there any indicator that measures this impact? So please think who would like to respond to that one, uh, not an easy one. And the second one is private finance, mostly through FDI, is an important source for a quick and effective green recovery. However, FDI in developing countries is expected to decline sharply. How to mobilize national private finance in these countries? Another interesting question. Do I have any volunteer? Eric, uh, Joy, and I think Edward. Thanks, Abby. I mean, uh, the first question is, is obviously, you know, a very important one. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, we really are shifting from the notion of sustainability as a risk that needs to be managed towards, uh, we, in the past, we talked about opportunity, but opportunity sort of implies it's a narrow green finance, um, one project, one transaction. The more recent developments around green taxonomies and otherwise are the notion of impact and really understanding the impact of your financing. For an ING or a Citibank or a Kenya commercial bank, this is not simple, but it's very important. And we're really getting serious engagement on banks putting in place systems to monitor impact. So um, an ING in Fluske is one of the leaders in this area how exactly across all portfolios of business can we start to measure the impact of our financing? And then we can start to um, understand as, as a bank, what is the impact of a $10 billion uh, uh, financing in a certain sector? What are we offsetting? How do we start disclosing on those impacts? And we have the EU who's put forward the, the green taxonomy and, and other uh, markets as well. And we, we need to start truing up how you compare understanding apples and apples. So there's a lot of work to be done. The last comment is, you know, the financial system operates um, based on accounting standards and accounting standards in most markets of the world are defined through the um, IASPE, the IFRS um, um, uh, set of guidance, which is what accountants use to prepare the books on companies. Um, uh, IFRS has recently announced that they intend to set up a parallel system for sustainability, essentially impact measurement, which will sit alongside the financial accounting standards. Potentially, once this gets in place, this will be very powerful because then we'll have the accountants. Once you have the accountants, you have the legal profession, you have the financial advisors, you have the investors, the, the banks, and everybody essentially speaking the same language. That's what we need to get clarity on what impact is. And so it's a somewhat long answer to a very important question. Thank you, Eric. Joy? 
Yes, as far as the public finance is concerned under the Global Recovery Observatory, we actually have a look at the public spending uh, for the different categories of green investment, or rather that being of renewable energy, energy efficiency, efficient buildings, and natural capital to a certain extent. And it actually analyzed its uh, impact, but it's not actually based on the indicators per se. Um, if it's about based on the indicators, we actually have also um, completed now, right now based on the modeling on the, the green um, investment model. And it's actually impact based on the existing indicators vis-a-vis -vis the business as usual uh, investment. So there is this comparison between the green recovery uh, versus, you know, without green investment for the recovery uh, scenario and then the comparison of the impacts. Thank you. Thank you, John. Edward, over to you. I've, I hope that you will also answer the, the question on uh, on the role of FDI and, of course, domestic capital uh, as a counterbalance if FDI is declining. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I would like to address is the second question. And I'm going to focus particularly on developing countries, which I believe the questioner was was thinking about. Um, I think that uh, there, I think what we need to do is think about three types of policy approaches in developing countries. One is one that Ona mentioned, which is um, what he called subsidy repurposing. I would call subsidy swaps. Is that in many low and middle income countries, um, one could successfully swap um, fossil fuel subsidies uh, to fund. Um, expansion of renewable energy and energy efficiency to deal with the, the, the critical problem in many poor countries of uh, energy poverty in rural areas, the lack of energy, uh, access to energy. And one could do the same thing with irrigation and agricultural subsidies. Again, swap out some of the subsidies and repurpose them towards um, expanding uh, water and sanitation, which are in dire needs. So one could target switching of subsidies to uh, in developing countries that are cash strapped uh, towards the type of sustainable development goals we want to, to see uh, fulfilled in those countries. Um, the second one is that uh, there are policies that have been adopted in developing countries that have received very little attention um, that have, have quite far reaching implications. One is what colleagues and I have called the tropical carbon tax where Costa Rica and Colombia have, uh, have put a tax on fossil fuel imports and use, which benefit mainly urban and, and richer households, and repurpose some of those funds to fund natural climate solutions. Uh, Costa Rica has been funding its, its biodiversity conservation since 1997 doing this. Colombia has done it recently in 2016. Um, uh, billions of dollars could be done if other countries, uh, developing countries, adopted similar types of policies. And with assistance of the private sector and, and aid agencies in, in setting up these schemes, uh, this could be done effectively. Then related to that, uh, the World Bank has this program where developing countries are, are, are working with the World Bank on pre preparing their market preparedness for introducing carbon pricing and pricing reforms uh, uh, there. I think that could be extended to include green investments uh, and, and get involved uh, the global financial private sector along with the World Bank in trying to um, get this market preparedness to, to get the type of, uh, uh, of market readiness for investments within developing countries. Well, uh, I would like to thank you all for your insight, your comments. I, I, I can see that that's a subject that is a, is a passion for you and, uh, and, and something that you're um, putting all your efforts into uh, through your respective organizations and, and of course, institutions. Um, so we have reached the end. And um, I would like to ask um, Hossein Federer to his, the head of the Secretariat of the UN Environmental Management Group in Geneva to close this event with his remarks. Hossein, over to you. Uh, Hossein, just uh, uh, we see that you're on mute, just uh, Hussein, 
Uh, in lieu of Jose making closing remarks, I will jump in. So my name is Nina Arden. I'm the Senior Nexus Dialogue Consultant. So on behalf of the EMG Secretariat, we have the next uh, closing, uh, the next third part of this series, addressing COVID-19 for the environment, will occur on the 15th of June. I thank you all very much for all of your expert remarks. And uh, please continue to remain updated on our landing page as we will have the uh, recorded playback there as well as the outcome document hopefully within the within a week or two uh, given potential delays of remote officing but i thank you so much for tuning in today and please uh, keep abreast and updated on our outcome documents but thank you very much Thank you. It has been a, a fascinating discussion. And uh, of course, we're looking forward from our side to, to contact you bilaterally and maybe as a group to, to see if we can do uh, you know, work together. So thank you again to all of you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Thank you very much.